data provides this really great opportunity to do that. I mean, it is a common resource that we can use in the international intelligence community. Um, you know, I've worked in the field for the better part of the past 12 years, and there's so much siloing and stove typing, as stove typing of technology, we just pump stuff out. We tend to work with blinders on to what each other are doing, and we don't really leverage the work that, that each other are doing um, for a common good. And, you know, I was in South Sudan very recently, and people were telling me that South Sudan is a data desert, and that you can't find information. And I was looking for information on how you could design a good voter education program in advance of the next elections. And so I wanted you know, population data, I wanted eligible voter data, I wanted polarization data, I wanted you know, data from the last election, I wanted radio and mobile coverage data to really present a campaign. And I went to look for it, and there was nothing. And it was true, it's like very small organizations and sure enough, everybody had this data sitting somewhere on their desktop, sitting somewhere on their server, um, all in formats that were interoperable. Um, and it's good to you know, for defining all the terms, so I don't know if you can find them. Um, so, so, uh, so I ended up cobbling everything together, and I found there was duplication in efforts in a lot of cases. Two organizations with funding from the same source were mapping schools, which were also polling centers. You guys were doing the same work, um, and there was no common uh, repository where people were putting this information so that everybody could benefit from that. So I think we need a bit of cultural reorientation. Um, segue into Tunisia. Uh, so for the Tunisia election data project, um, the Tunisia election data is a project that seeks to collect, open, analyze, and visualize election data on an ongoing basis. Um, it, the overarching goal of the project is to try to work with election stakeholders, mainly election officials, uh, to try to use better information to drive decision making that improves the process. It's a really practical goal. And the lead of this uh, uh, coalition, uh, it's, it's a group effort, it's a group called Rocky Group, which is a Canadian civil society group, which is dedicated to observing elections and engaging election reform. Um, the initial election data platform was actually built on the back of work that was done by a group called Open Government Tunisia, Open Government TN. Um, these guys had, um, uh, during the 2000 election, volunteers uh, collected and opened one of the, um, they had 264 delegations, which are the equivalent of counties, uh, for lack of a better term. So we were working to visualize that data down to such a, a, a micro level. What you saw from that data was that there was there were these trends where the coastal areas and the urban areas uh, you, know, you had significantly higher levels of voter registration, uh, whereas in the rural areas, the central parts of the country, um, this seems very logical, um, where access to information is lower and infrastructure is, is weaker, they had significantly lower numbers of voter registration. So the difference was between 70 to 80 percent in coastal areas, 20 to 30 percent, 40 percent in some areas in the hinterlands, and that seemed extremely uh, unfair, and, and so it made the argument for where the election commission needed to target its resources uh, to, to increase voter registration to make sure people's voices were heard. Uh, another visualization was the canceled ballots, and when you did the, the, the canceled ballots or the invalidated ballots uh, visualization, you saw a similar trend in that you know, areas where there were lower levels of literacy, you had higher numbers of invalid ballots. And so in Tunis, the capital, one out of every hundred ballots was invalidated. Whereas in you know, another area called Catholic of the country, one of 20 ballots was invalidated. So not only did these people have lower levels of voter registration, they had higher numbers of canceled ballots. And so this, the press conference deployed, um, and we used it to create a full instead of finder app um, so that people could find where to register, where to vote. And so it had multiple benefits. Two thirds of Tunisia is online. Um, so it seemed a pretty practical uh, thing to do in that environment. Um, after the elections were over, uh, the election commission had an interest in making data open uh, to the extent possible. They did not have the resources, they did not have the capacity to do it, um, and so they turned it over to Rocky Moon and uh, Open Gov Tunisia. The guys, here are all 11,000 plus polling station results for us. Can you make them open for us? And of course, we obliged, we worked with them to, to open every single piece of data, 15 volunteers. Uh, trained by OpenGov over the course of two months, put every single piece of data, uh, converted into CSV and JSON format, uh, and created an API so that anybody could access that information if they wanted results, which is a segment of results from either a constituency or from a, uh, a polling uh, uh, or, or party or whatever it may be. Um, and so 
that was made available on the Tunisia Electric Data Platform. And it, it actually unwittingly set a precedent. This is the, the highest level of transparency of any election in the Middle East region. There's no other election commission or any, there's no election data that's made that granularly, regularly available anywhere in the near region. So it was actually a pretty positive benefit that we didn't realize at the time. Um, it's all open and available for people to use. Um, everything on the platform uh, is uh, documented. Their source attribution for where it all comes from, all the data is, is on GitHub, uh, where it's licensed and Creative Commons most permissive license for any use of so anybody can use the data uh, if they want. There's documentation, there's a methodology section. Uh, there's a methodology section which details how you can create these exact same visualizations using the data. Um, so it's 100% open. Uh, we've documented, sourced, licensed uh, everything. Um, and it's, it's something that we're really proud of. And it actually influenced a project in Lebanon. Uh, so there's a Lebanon election data project now that was built in the back. And so it's, it's spreading. Um, and we would love to find ways to support one of them. Thank you. Uh, and one yeah. I don't is that uh, practice. You know, we understand, you know, understanding the ecosystem is something that we don't always do. And of course, we have to try to learn the ecosystem to get comfortable with it. Um, you know, respect it for that matter. I think that the, the thing that, that we need to, to be mindful of, is, and I call it the no dumping policy, uh, is no dumping or littering in the ecosystem with you know, proprietary software that is only good for one election one time. Um, you know, we've done that for years when we build some sort of you know, database that's used by a group once. Um, and then you know, we, we put the, the code in a closed repository. You might as well put it in a casket because it is, it is dead. That project is never going to be useful again. You spent a lot of money on something that nobody else can use. Um, and so it's better to, 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 to use open source. I mean, you don't build a you know, proprietary Elmo when Elmo exists and you can contribute to it and reuse it and make it better. Um, there's no reason to do that. And it's the same dumping policy with just dumping people dump technology you know, into hardware, into environments. You know, we bring you know, tablets and computers and smartphones that are not native to the environment in which we're working. We just dump it. On civil society groups because it's cool and it's it's, it's awesome, uh, but it's not native, it's not familiar, it's not user friendly, nor is it reliable. And there's a very good chance that the the, the infrastructure can't handle it. And so we're overwhelming the infrastructure of the environment that we're working in. And so I guess I would say you know, we as the international development community need to stop littering, prevent littering from jumping. Uh, that would be my point. So uh, the other two of you, what best practice or what? Best practice to avoid. Practice to avoid. Either way, Michael's decided to be a practice to avoid. But what what one cue would you give to the international, uh, the international civil society, international development community in this territory? Uh, don't build for the web of ten years ago. Build for the web <laughs> of today. The open web has changed. Cloud has made it possible for small interventions to have enormous scalable impact with absolutely almost no, no front-end cost uh, in terms of infrastructure. In, in the old days, you had to buy a server rack. You had to buy, get a room to put the server in. You had to buy the software to go on the server. You had to buy a person to manage that system. You had to do a whole host of upfront capital intensive investments to get started on a technology project. And all of that's been obliterated by the cloud. So in this sort of no dumping policy, in this sort of like building for today, not yesterday, the, the, uh, the, the drive to be open source is to share, but also has to be willing to take the critique and say, how do we build something together better? So you can only do that if you have, I think, great vision, but also the willingness to take the critique forward in a truly collaborative way at the international level. I think that's also true for our partners at the civil society level. We want them to be group. People's identities in this information that can be used for any purposes, you know, they're people for that matter. Um, so all the data that was sitting in, in the GitHub repository is completely and totally cleaned, all that data, uh, which is really important and it's also not necessarily germane to the work. Um, so if you're just trying to increase voter registration at large, you don't need to know all that individual information. That doesn't need to Accessible, you just need to know that there are 29% of the population is, is, you know, is registered in this district. Um, you know, of that, you know, there are 70% of the women are not registered, so you need to do a better job of reaching out to women in those communities in particular. Um, 
And so that's the stuff that's important. So we, we are extremely mindful of not including any personal identifiable information in any of the building. John or Ryan, anything to add? Uh, this is a favorite topic of mine, the downside risk of all of these types of projects. Um, it's a, things like election monitoring or observing. It's a huge risk. I mean, off, what we did on for our civic for our voter information API was to publish data that was already public. But there are yeah, but there are these other data sets or other sources of information that are kept and problematic and need to be looked at very carefully. You know, just even things like if you created some kind of mechanism to publish, you know, photographs of a protest or or election events. Well you're actually giving the government pictures of all the people who were there. And depending on the regime type, uh, I guess they could use that information to selectively identify people and then follow up with them. So yeah, you have to be very careful when working in, in space. Any, any information on digital, uh, digital media, there's this thing called the CIA, the Confidentiality, Confidentiality Integrity and Accessibility Triangle, the triad. And so in order for data to be accessible, you're probably going to compromise, perhaps you could potentially more open yourself to confidentiality issues. So I think the, the short answer to that is that, um, yes, there are great protocols and there's best practices. Sometimes the question might be like, you could just want to use tech for that. Maybe you don't need to use a tech for